Episode 30 Midsummer in Patuxet Hot days and humid nights Temper our dreams And the shouts from impassioned strollers Hasten down the fair street Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxet General I am your host, Jess It is steamy in our little town this week So let's try some vegetarian options We have a hydrating and super tasty cucumber cooler and a -a make-ahead potato leek soup, which paired with a good salad makes a great summer meal. But first, I would like to thank our Patreon subscribers. These revolutionary patriots are the wind that fills the sails of the ship that is the Patuxet General, without whom we would surely be adrift on a soundbar. So... If you would like to be part of our Patuxet General community, please follow the show notes to our Patreon page so that you can subscribe and receive loads of extra content. Plus, first glance everything we do. We thank you. Now let's get to it. A recipe, a drink, and the case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. Off we go with a cucumber smoothie. This smoothie all stems from a memory I have dining out with my family in this little French restaurant on the east side of Providence. I had begged for this drink, and by the time my dinner had came, it was gone, and I wanted another, so my mom got the recipe to take home. I do not remember the dinner, just the drink. This and its companion drink on the menu, the strawberry cooler, became staples in our home. So much so that Dad would often try to stick some extra nutrition in. Sometimes it worked, sometimes not so much. I still shudder at the memory of choking on a whole bunch of wheat germ through the straw when I was expecting strawberry milk. But with experimentation, there were some really cool strides. Like peanut butter banana shakes. Very nice. Today, we'll do the base strawberry one and a green cucumber super smoothie. Guilt-free. So, for the strawberry cooler, you will need eight large frozen strawberries, two-thirds of a cup plain or strawberry yogurt, two large tablespoons of sugar or honey, two cups milk, and a blender. Add all these things to the blender and blend until smooth. Serve in a tall milkshake glass and try not to get brain freeze. Now, this green concoction is totally yummy and guilt-free. For this, You will need one half English cucumber cut into chunks, one cup of frozen pineapple, juice of one lime, half an avocado, a handful of baby spinach, two tablespoons of honey, and one cup nut milk of your choice. I like coconut. Blend all this together and you can skip salad. Enjoy. Today's recipe, potato leek soup. Years ago, while working at Little Falls, a couple came in and asked to speak with me. Since I was well known in the village for my soups, they had come to me to make a soup for an upcoming Passover celebration. S asked if I could follow this very specific recipe, as it was heavily researched and had to be made with specific arrangements. I told S and P that I would, and in the upcoming week I purchased a new knife, cookpot, box grater, and cutting board. I took it very seriously, followed it to the letter, and it turned out well. I was happy for the challenge and the great friendships that were forged over soup that day. I saw my friend P the other day and recalled how we met. While we spoke of S's passing, I thought I might talk about this dish in his honor. That said, no matter how I try, I cannot find my copy of this recipe, and I never throw away recipes. Luckily for me, and you, it only had four ingredients and some peculiar preparation. So I racked my brain and did a bunch of research on Sephardic cooking, and come to find out Julia Child had a very similar recipe in her The Way to Cook cookbook. There were the same four ingredients, but very different technique. So let's check out Jess's potato leek soup. For this recipe, you will need two large glass bowls, four cups sliced leeks, thinly sliced, then thoroughly washed, four cups potatoes shredded. I used a box grater, but you could shred any way you choose, food processor, mandolin, or finely shredded frozen potatoes. All must be kosher. Six to seven cups of water, two teaspoons of salt, and uh, the rest is optional. One half cup sour cream, if you fly that way. Otherwise, you could use a vegan sour cream replacement and one bunch of dill. 
finely chopped. Take a large glass bowl, fill it halfway with water. Shred the potatoes, which have been cleaned in salt water and checked for bugs. If you find any, start over with fresh ingredients. Let the shredded potatoes soak while you cut and wash the leeks. Cut them in half lengthwise, then, with the flat side down, slice them into half moons. Transfer these into a glass bowl filled halfway with water. Put your hands in there and wash off the dirt. Then let sit for about five minutes so the dirt will sink to the bottom. Strain out the leeks and put them aside. Take a large milk use pot and when hot on a medium high stove, add the wet leeks, then salt. Sweat the leeks a bit, then toss in the shredded potatoes and the water and simmer until tender. Serve just this way or with sour cream on top with dill or blended with sour cream and chives on top or blended with heavy cream whisked in. All is acceptable. Most of all, I hope you enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now a continuation of our House on the Corner series, a reading of The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft, Chapter 5, Section 3. From that frightful smell and that uncanny noise, Willette's attention could no longer be diverted. Both were plainer and more hideous in the great pillared hall than anywhere else, and carried a vague impression of being far below, even in this dark netherworld of subterrane mystery. Before trying any of the black archways for steps leading further down, the doctor cast his beam of light about the stone-flagged floor. It was loosely paved, and at irregular intervals there would occur a slab curiously pierced by small holes in no definite arrangement, while at one point there lay a very long ladder carelessly flung about. To this ladder, singularly enough, appeared to cling a particularly large amount of the frightful odor which encompassed everything. As he walked slowly about it, it suddenly occurred to Willette that both the noise and the odor seemed strongest directly above the oddly pierced slabs, as if they might be for crude trap doors leading down to some still deeper region of the horror. Kneeling by one, he worked at it with his hands and found with extreme difficulty that he could budge it. At his touch, the moaning beneath ascended to a louder key and only with vast trepidation did he persevere in the lifting of the heavy stone. A stench unnameable now rose up from below, and the doctor's head reeled dizzily as he laid back the slab and turned his torch upon this exposed square yard of gaping blackness. If he had expected a flight of steps to some wide gulf of ultimate abomination, Willette was destined to be disappointed. For amidst that photo and cracked whining, he discerned only the brick-faced top of a cylindrical well, perhaps a yard and a half in diameter, and devoid of any ladder or other means of descent. As the light shone down, the wailing changed suddenly to a series of horrible yelps in conjunction with which there came again that sound of blind, fertile scrambling and slippery thumping. The explorer trembled, unwilling even to imagine what noxious odor might be lurking in that abyss, but in a moment mustered up the courage to peer over the rough hoon brink. Lying at full length and holding the torch down at an arm's length to see what might lie below. For a second, he could distinguish nothing but the slimy, moss-grown brick walls sinking illimitedly in the half-tangible miasma of murk and foulness and anguished frenzy. And then he saw something dark was leaping clumsily and frantically up and down at the bottom of the narrow shaft, which must have been from twenty to twenty-five feet below the stone floor which he lay. The torch shook in his hand, but he looked again to see what manner of living creature might be immured there in the darkness of that unnatural well, left starving by young Ward through all the long months since the doctors had taken him away. 
and clearly only one of a vast number prisoned in these kindred wells, whose pierced stone covers so thickly studded the floor of the great vaulted cavern. Whatever the things were, they could not lie down in their cramped spaces, but must have crouched and whined and waited and feebly leaped all those hideous weeks since their master had abandoned them unheeded. But Marinus Bickwell Willett was sorry that he looked again. For surgeon and veteran of the dissecting room though he was, he had not been the same since. It's hard to explain just how a single sight of a tangible object with measurable dimensions could so shake and change a man. We may only say that there is about certain outlines and entities a power of symbolism and suggestion which acts frightfully on the sensitive thinker's perceptive and whispers terrible hints of obscure cosmic relationships and unnameable realities beyond the protective illusions of common vision. In that second look, Willette saw such an outline or entity, for during the next few instants, he was undoubtedly as stark mad as any inmate of Dr. Waite's private hospital. He dropped the electric torch from a hand drained of muscular power or nervous coordination, nor heeded the sound of crunching teeth, which told its fate at the bottom of the pit. He screamed and screamed and screamed in a voice whose falsetto panic no acquaintance of his would ever have recognized. And though he could not rise to his feet, he crawled and rolled desperately away over the damp pavement where dozens of Tartian wells poured forth their exhausted whining and yelping to answer his own insane cries. He tore his hands on the rough, loose stones and many times bruised his head against the frequent pillars. But still he kept on. Then at last, he slowly came to himself in the utter blackness and stench and stopped his ears against the droning wail into which the burst of yelping had subsided. He was drenched with perspiration and without means of producing a light. Stricken and unnerved in the abysmal blackness and horror, and crushed with a memory he could never efface. Beneath him, dozens of these things still lived, and from one of the shafts the cover had been removed. He knew what he had seen could never climb up the slippery walls, yet shuddered at the thought that some obscure foothold might exist. What the thing was, he would never tell. It was like some of the carvings on the hellish altar, but it was alive. Nature had never made it in this form, for it was too palpably unfinished. The deficiencies were of the most surprising sort, and the abnormalities of the proportion could not be described. Willette consents only to say that this type of thing must have represented entities which Ward called up from imperfect salts, and which he kept for the servile or ritualistic purposes. If it had not had a certain significance, its image would not have been carved into the damnable stone. And it was not the worst thing depicted on that stone, but Willette never opened the other pits. At the time, the first connected idea in his mind was an idle paragraph from one of the old Kerwin data he had digested long before, a phrase used by Simon or Jedediah Orne in that portentous confiscated letter to the bygone sorcerer. Certainly there was nothing but the loveliest awfulness in that which H raised up from what he could gather only a part of. Then, horribly supplementing rather than displacing this image, there came a recollection of those ancient lingering rumors against the burn-twisted thing found in a field after the Kerwin raid. Charles Ward had once told the doctor what old Slocum said of the object, that it was neither thoroughly human nor wholly allied to any animal which Patuxet folks had ever seen or read about. These words hummed in the doctor's mind as he rocked to and fro, squatting on the nitrous stone floor. He tried to drive them out and repeated the Lord's prayer to himself, eventually trailing off into a mnemonic hodgepodge like the modernistic wasteland of Mr. T.S. Eliot, and finally reverting to the oft-repeated dual formula he had lately found in Ward's underground library, Yagnath Zognath, and so on, until the final underline Zro. It seemed to soothe him, and he staggered to his feet after a time, lamenting bitterly the fright-lost torch, and looking wildly for any gleam of light in the clutching inkiness of the chilly air. But he strained his eyes in every direction for some faint glow or recollection of the bright illumination he had left in the library. 
After a while, he thought he detected a suspicion of a glow infinitely far away, and toward this he crawled in agonized caution on hands and knees amidst the stench and howling, always feeling ahead lest he collide with the numerous great pillars or stumble into the abominable pit he had uncovered. Once, his shaking hands touched something which he knew must be the steps leading up to the hellish altar, and from the spot he recoiled in loathing. At another time, he encountered the pierced slab he had removed, and here his caution became almost pitiful. But he did not come across the dread aperture after all, nor did anything issue from the aperture to detain him. What had been down there made no sound, no stir. Evidently, its crunching of the fallen electric torch had not been good for it. Each time Willette's fingers felt a perforated slab, he trembled. His passage over it would sometimes increase the groaning below, and generally it would produce no effect at all, since he moved so very noiselessly. Several times during his progress, the glow ahead diminished perceptibly, and he realized that various candles and lamps he had left must be expiring one by one. The thought of being lost in utter darkness without matches amidst this underground world of nightmare labyrinths impelled him to rise to his feet and run, which he could safely do now that he passed the open pit. For he knew that once the light failed, his only hope of rescue and survival would lie in whatever relief party Mr. Ward might send after missing him for a sufficient period. Presently, however, he emerged from the open space into the narrower corridor and definitely located the glow as coming from a door on his right. In a moment, he had reached it, and he was standing once more in young Ward's secret library, trembling with relief and watching the sputterings of that last lamp which had brought him to safety. Thank you again for joining us here at the PG. There are so many ways to enjoy your time with us now, either in person at our pop-up general store, Tag Sale Treasures on Broad Street, Cranston, Rhode Island, or on YouTube with a sunrise, or anywhere you listen to podcasts, or even our own webpage. You can reach us at our email, jess at patuxetgeneral.com. If you send us a ghost story, we'll read it on the air. But until then, I'll meet you right back here at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxet. <laughs>